Hey there. <laughs> this is Dean Walker from Living Resilience and, of course, the Poetry of Predicament podcast. And um, I'm going to do something that's a little bit out of character. I'm going to be including a little bit more doom scrolling and uh, kind of typical fare for the doom scrolling crowd um, because it's spoken uh, so much by the main person I'm excerpting, uh, a recent uh, video from from Nate Hagens, who in the past couple of years has just skyrocketed to a place of quite a, quite a bit of well-deserved prominence in the podcast world. Um, he, uh, you know, he's more prolific than I ever want to be by an order of magnitude. But um, I, what I can say is that he is doing a, a tremendous high integrity job. And so uh, my hat is off to him. And um, I'm just going to be excerpting a few pieces from a recent uh, shorter version of his podcast that he calls Frankly. And I'm, I'm very much in agreement with a lot of what he says here. The main point of this particular po mini podcast episode from uh, Nate Hagens is uh, how do we intersect AI, artificial intelligence, and our uh, many predicaments regarding the environment. Is there a way to have them intersect in anything um, like a positive way? Um, I'm just going to give you the, the punchline if you want to just, uh, <laughs> you can just skip over this whole thing if you'd like. The punchline is that uh, giving AI to those who are in charge of the very various uh, governments and corporations and so on around the world is like giving an alcoholic a pound of meth amphetamine and uh, telling them to go fix something. <laughs> it is just insane. So uh, there's a few ways in which uh, Nate says it quite well. And again, there's right in the middle of it, there's a bit of, uh, of doom scrolling and I'm gonna let him just do that and I won't re be recapping it much, but I doubt there's gonna be anything new for you, the regular listener here. So he's gonna start out with uh, uh, how he has just uh, asked chat GPT-4 for a list of ways that AI might be helpful. And uh, in, in terms of solving climate change. So you'll see that list, you'll hear his commentary you know, I'll just again give you the punchline from me is it's a, it's a bit uh, predictable. It's not particularly creative. It's just a list of, of topics that uh, AI might be helpful in exploring. Uh, there are paragraphs evidently underneath this list of topics that he, he mentions that as well. But um, I would not hold my breath that there's a tremendous amount of possibility of that, that positive outcome that uh, he's hoping for here. And I know that he is also quite skeptical of that as well. So let's, uh, let's hear about his adventure and with chat materials GPT. That will be four. more sustainable. Um, I asked chat GPT-4 recently, how could AI solve climate change? And I'll just briefly read what the answers were. Transition to renewable energy, energy efficiency, and there were paragraphs under each of these. Electrify transportation, sustainable urban planning, carbon pricing, reforestation and conservation, sustainable agriculture, green technology and innovation, international cooperation, adaptation, education and awareness, policy and regulation, investment in infrastructure, sustainable lifestyle choices, economic diversification. Uh, then there was an asterisk. Addressing climate change and oil resource peaking requires a multifaceted approach and sustained effort at all levels of society. Collaboration among governments, businesses, communities, and individuals is crucial to achieving meaningful progress in mitigating these risks. So I'm, I'm going to unpack that a little bit, um, but I first uh, want to highlight some big uh, um, stratospheric gaps that the technologists um, have in looking at climate change and our future trajectory. Uh, the first... 
Okay, so as I mentioned, um, <laughs> I you know I'm I'm not at all impressed by the Chat GPT for list. Uh, I'm glad he did it. It was really good to get a sample of that. If you haven't already tried out GPT four or any of the GPTs, anyway, um, I you know some words that caught my ear were um, it's going to require multifaceted approach collaboration between governments and corporations and communities and individuals is crucial. So yeah, isn't it funny how easy those words are to say and easy, easier still for chat GPT-4 because there's nothing at stake. Um, you can tell me what you think the possibility is of large scale, global scale collaboration between governments, corporations, communities, and individuals and maintaining that multifaceted approach over time, starting immediately. So, you know, you can hear my curmudgeon and uh, so let's move on to the next thing. This next piece is, is truly extraordinary. Uh, in This is all going into the sense-making course here in Living Resilience that we have on the Living Resilience uh, online community space of Mighty Networks space. And uh, the, the sense-making course is, is an ongoing, ever-growing and evolving uh, work in progress that is meant to help us sense-make in these insane times. Now, let's just you and me recount for a second, who's got the biggest power right now in the world? Hmm, would be white guys, mostly. And it would be those with a whole lot of money and those with enough money to be able to buy governments and buy influence wherever they go and uh, basically get whatever they want whenever they want. He, uh, Nate uh, brings up a remar remarkable statement by Mark Andreessen, you know, who's one of the major tech bro billionaires. And um, you'll hear him uh, speak about <laughs> uh, Mark Andreessen's projections of just how, what we could dream about, what we really should be pointing for in, in our global culture, and that is to increase energy consumption by not a hundred times, not a thousand times, but by 5,000 times what it is now. And he gives you just some of the rough out of what that would cost in terms of our global environmental systems. It just, it would be, uh, it would obliterate us in, in very short order. So um, the thing that I just want to underscore here, because he'll say it somewhat, and I'll probably say it again before the end of this video, but uh, when we have very, very wealthy and powerful people, people who have as much influence as they could ever want uh, running the show. And they're making projections and statements like Mark Andreessen's. Well, you'll hear Nate's disbelief, jaw dropped, disbelief. And mine's about the same. And so um, I don't think we should be expecting too much more than this from any of the other very wealthy white men tech bro oligarchs. Let's hear about Mark Andreessen. Uh, the first has to do with energy blindness. Here's a quote from a guy named Mark Andreessen, who is a Silicon Valley billionaire, uh, a large proponent of artificial intelligence. We believe energy should be in an upward spiral. Energy is the foundational engine of our civilization. On that, I agree with him. The more energy we have, the more people we can have, and the better everyone's lives can be. We should raise everyone to the energy consumption level we have, then increase our energy 1,000 times, then raise everyone else's energy 1,000 times as well. What? This is so unbelievably energy blind. So what he's talking about is the United States uses five times the world average, give or take. So a five-fold increase to bring everyone up to us, then a thousand-fold increase for everyone. 
And notice he said that we would increase ours a thousand times first and then bring everyone else up, which I thought was an odd wording. 5,000 times increase in energy. Here's uh, an interesting fact. So there is a, a heat dissipating effect when we burn energy. The focus now is on climate change because there's a thermal blanket over the earth that we are uh, trapping heat from CO2. The heat dissipating heat from burning energy is only around four or five percent right now of the CO2 warming impact. But at a 5,000 time increase in energy, even if it was all completely low carbon, the heat from that energy would raise the global temperature 40 degrees Fahrenheit to roughly human body temperature. If we went to 7,000 times, which would be not too much longer in uh, Mr. Andreessen's terms, we would boil the oceans. The waste heat impact on Earth would be that much. This is just catastrophically energy blind. And I have a chip on my shoulder with this because I have a master's in finance. I know a lot of people working on Wall Street and in tech. They're well-intentioned. They're just absolutely clueless of the physics, the energy, and the ecology of our situation. Uh, so that's Okay. Well, um, <laughs> that's it on the Mark Andreessen thing. Uh, this is where Nate does a little bit of his doom scrolling and reminding us of some of the context, historical and current context for what of uh, beyond climate change, what are some of the other existential global scale situations uh, we have on our plate, uh, predicaments, if you will. So let's hear uh, Nate doom scroll for a couple of minutes, <clears throat> and then we'll come back and really um, put a, a capper at the end of this series of clips and um, see if we can bring in the, the whole picture or as clear a picture as we can about AI's influence in this whole mess. So here we go. So in the best case, um, AI could boost our productivity in combination with blockchain or other things. And in the past, our productivity has largely come from the carbon pulse uh, powering the machines. And of course, our stories say that it's the machines and human ingenuity that have brought us to this point. But we kind of neglect the fact that energy has been increasing every single year. So um, even if productivity is able to be increased by artificial intelligence, we still have these other risks that are that are present. And for instance, um, the AI proponents think that we will uh, accelerate development of nuclear fission and also crack the code of nuclear fusion. But even if nuclear fusion were figured out right today in November of 2023, we would need 20 years of safety testing and implementation and rolling it out and changes. So timing, given the four horsemen, is also uh, a, a big risk. But even if the productivity were able to increase, uh, this leads to another uh, blindness, which is ecology blind. Um, that AI isn't ecology blind. AI is just a tool. But the purveyors and users of AI within the system are completely ecology blind. We um, hear often in the news, especially in the financial news, that artificial intelligence and blockchain will lead us to an exponential age. From an ecology perspective, we have just lived through an exponential age uh, in a negative way. Um, this didn't happen recently, um, you might not know this quote, but I'm going to read it. We live in a zoologically impoverished world from which all the hugest and fiercest and strangest forms have recently disappeared. And it is no doubt a much better world for us now that they have gone. Yet it is a marvelous fact and one that has not been sufficiently dwelt upon. This sudden dying out of so many large mammalia, not in one place, but in half the land surface of the globe. This quote is not from 2017. 
This is from Alfred Russell Wallace over 150, almost 150 years ago, 1876. And since then, things have gotten much, much worse. Of the 8 million species on Earth, uh, 1 million are currently classified at a risk of extinction. We've lost, on average, 70% of the populations of animals, insects, birds, and fish since the year 1970. Our extinctions are 10,000 times the background rate. We've had things like 98% of elephants populations are gone. Many, many other individual statistics like that. 33% of marine mammals uh, are threatened with extinction. Insects are declining at 1% to 2% a year. So if AI can solve climate change, that itself is systems blind because we have many other planetary boundaries uh, like microplastics, endocrine disruptors, organic pollutants. By the way, uh, endocrine disruptors, next week is Jeremy Grantham will be on the show talking about how one couple in seven can no longer reproduce. And this is because of endocrine disruptors. And 20, 30 years ago, it was zero in seven, and this is accelerating. Um, we have genetically modified organisms, uh, threatening bio, biosphere integrity. On the climate side, it's not just the temperatures, but the impact on ecosystems. Two days ago, it was 108 degrees in Brazil in spring, and the humidity made it like 130 something. What is happening to the Amazon forest, which is one of the lungs of the planet, which is now, from a carbon standpoint, turning into a source of carbon, not a sink. And this is also happening in the northern boreal forests. Um, to think that AI can solve these things while growing the economy is, is paramount of ecology blindness. So this leads to uh, you know, a core problem I have with the artificial intelligence narrative, which is um, we're continuing to grow the entire system while tweaking it on the side. Uh, since 1990, we have gotten massively energy efficient. We've increased our energy efficiency by over 30% globally, and yet um, we've grown our total energy by 60 some percent. So where is it in AI um, that is a subset of the market uh, that we're going to reduce our energy use, reduce our impact on nature? So I asked uh, ChatGPT a follow-up question. Uh, is there any example of humans collaborating at a global level to actually solve climate change? The response was the Paris Agreement, adopted in 2015, is one notable example of international efforts to address climate change. The agreement brought together countries from around the world with the goal of limiting global temperature increase to well below 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Well, how's that working out? Yesterday, uh, I saw a stat that since the Paris Accord, global society has increased new coal capacity over 200 gigawatts. Temperatures continue to increase, emissions continue to increase, energy use continues to increase. To plan on AI solving this is like dousing a forest fire with gasoline and a little math. So AI, we have to recognize, is a tool. One of the best. So this last piece is where uh, Nate brings together AI and our current ecological state and uh, the predicaments that we're facing. And um, I think he does a really good job of just mentioning, as Dennis Meadows does in an earlier podcast, um, that AI is a massive amplifier. And what it's going to be amplifying is all the motivations that are behind the multi-billion dollar corporations that are each building their own AI force. And uh, Daniel Schmachtenberger, whom Nate has had uh, innumerable long uh, conversations with Daniel, and Daniel's, uh, some of his cornerstone uh, work in sense-making was to, to really articulate for us all 
what are some of the perverse incentives that are built into our business as usual structure? All the business as usual structures, systems, dynamics, this is just how the world works that way. Those I'm asserting, and I know that Nate is also asserting that these perverse incentives are, they, they really have no choice but to be baked into the AI inner workings. The motivations of AI are just brought straight over from standard business as usual modeling. So just to, a brief reminder of a few terms that, you know, I don't know, no, Nate won't be bringing them up, but so that you can reference them in other sense-making episodes from here in Living Resilience, or if you go to Nate's conversations with Daniel Schmachtenberger, they'll immediately make sense. <clears throat> and so uh, we've got the idea of perverse incentives, of rivalrous dynamics, and a race to the bottom in terms of the core motivations built into our uh, business as usual model, um, where it's profit before anything else, where there is really no choice but to take the low road and um, really beat the hell out of your competition. And that's the only way to succeed in the model as it's evolved. One last thing I'd like to say about this particular track <clears throat> is that it is clearly delusional to expect some sort of altruistic, benevolent AI solutions when it's been created with the perverse incentives that I've just been talking about baked in. We are truly delusional if we think that it's going to be anything other than self-terminating. So let's hear this point, and then there'll be one last thing before we go. Cool. One of the best quotes uh, from Dennis Meadows on a podcast from last year is he said, technology is a tool. And if someone's coming at you with a screwdriver and they switch it to a hammer, they're still coming at you. Artificial intelligence is like coming at you with a magic flaming sword uh, in one of those video games. You're going to be able to slay monsters and find more treasure faster, but the objective of the game hasn't changed. So artificial intelligence uh, is in service of the superorganism. And just like shale technology was to oil production of getting a larger straw and didn't really increase the amount of estimated ultimate uh, recovery. But what it did is it had a wider straw and allowed us to get the oil out faster. I fear that artificial intelligence um, with uh, an absence of wisdom and new governance and structures is going to act like a larger straw on the earth and our, on our ecology. It's like giving an alcoholic methamphetamines. So I am not anti-technology. I actually think that AI, with all the wonderful, amazing things that it could do, like uh, new medicines and, and new ways of, of discovering things and education, and uh, it, it, it boggles the mind what's possible. It could be the perfect tool that humanity needs right now, but it's lower on the threshold of the choreography of power. And maybe there's a thousand or maybe even a hundred AIs are going to control the world. And many of them are controlled by military or billionaires. And they are not in service of humanity or sustainability or ecology or the future. They are in service of, of the Mordor economy, of, uh, of Sauron, uh, of unmitigated power and growth. So how can we use our tools towards uh, a new aspirations, cultural values, governance, civic responsibility, purpose at this 11th hour of humanity on this planet towards better outcomes, we seriously need to have that conversation. Because right now, uh, AI is, is just going to make our situation worse 
because it's in service to the Moloch dynamic uh, that is the beating heart of, of our economic system. So again, my hat is off to Nate. Uh, in just a year's time, I've been watching his progress of assimilating this uh, really dense stuff from Daniel Schmachtenberger in particular. And uh, I think he's, he's really getting facile with being able to integrate it into his uh, obvious expertise in the energy sector. And um, I really, really appreciated the last piece that he just got through saying about how AI is a lot like fracking was to the oil extraction industry. It just came in with a bigger straw, a fancier straw, and was able to not really find any more than the predicted amount of oil, but it was able to go in and get it faster and get it to market faster. Um, and you heard as well as I did his uh, analogy of giving AI to the problem solvers, to the government leaders, the corporate leaders and so on of this planet to fix things is like giving a raging alcoholic a pound of meth and suggesting that they go and try to solve a problem or two. It's just insane. There's no center. There's no ethics. <clears throat> there's no saneness. There's no sanity in, in any part of this conversation. So um, uh, thank you so much for listening. This was just a quick update. I wanted to reflect on a really nice little piece that Nate put out. And I hope you will um, continue to dive into the AI related material in the sense making course here in Living Resilience. Um, I think you're going to find that there are a number of quite unusual voices that are different than the average because there's been such a flood in this past year about AI. So um, I'm also wide open to suggestions. If there's anything you'd like to platform or any particular voice you'd like to platform in any part of the conversation about sense making, but especially about the AI domain, uh, please don't hesitate to um, leave a comment here in this for this video. And again, thanks for watching. Thank you for joining us in another episode of the Poetry of Predicament. This podcast is produced by Dean Walker and the Living Resilience Alliance. Living Resilience exists to offer transformative support and resources to the collapse aware and collapse acceptant communities around the world.